So is there a quote unquote lost creation story? I put that I put that in quotes there because it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a stretch. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. It's a little bit uh, it's a little bit sensationalized. <laughs> if you haven't learned this about me, it's sometimes I like a, a title that's just just a tiny bit sensationalized. Get a little bit of you know, pique your interest a little bit. There is indeed a lost creation story. <clears throat> so it's not, it's not total, uh, uh, you know, balderdash. <clears throat> it's not totally made up. Uh, it's just not our creation story. Uh, so you may have heard that there are two creation stories in the Torah. I think we've talked about it in these Monday sessions. Genesis 1, uh, is one complete creation story. There's no Adam, no Eve. Uh, this is the, the, the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, right? These are the, uh, the first creation story. And then there's a separate creation story that seems to start from nothing. It says, you know, there, there was nothing but just barren wasteland and then God created Adam and then afterwards created other things in a different order. And there you've got Adam and Eve and you've got a snake and you've got this tree and that tree. You know, you've got knowledge and life. <clears throat> so you've got these two different versions of a creation story, two different perspectives, you could say. Uh, our tradition will teach that they are two different perspectives of the same story. Uh, just they give different information. One could also argue that there are uh, differences between them that might suggest they are different narratives entirely, uh, which I happen to believe, and I think they have different things to teach us. I think we can learn a lot more about these creation stories by looking at this lost creation story, which is not in our Torah, which is not in our Bible, and you'll see why when we read it. So first, let's begin with Genesis chapter 1. It's not that long of a chapter. We can make it through. This is going to be a text-heavy session. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've warned you in advance, I hope sufficiently, that we're going to be doing a lot of text this evening and uh, text criticism, talking about where these words uh, come from according to scholars, according to biblical scholars who study the history of these words in historical context. Uh, so this is your final um, so, sort of uh, uh, you know content warning. You know, right up here there should be a little you know <laughs> not for kids uh, thing. Or you know they have in the, the the corner of the screen it says you know TV fourteen. This is definitely a TV fourteen session. This is not for kids. So those are all of your warnings. You're still here. Good except for Sarah. I, I'm kidding. <laughs> I shouldn't pick on Sarah. I know she just got up from her chair for a moment. So Genesis chapter one, when God began to create the heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void with darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. What do we have so far? We've got unformed, void, darkness, wind, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, and it was good. God separated the light from the darkness, called the night, the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, a first day. Off to a good start. What did you do today? <laughs> God created, you know, the darkness and light. Okay, it's a pretty good day. Take, take a nap. Get up in the morning. God said, let there be an expanse, a rakia. Uh, I saw a couple of you pull out your, your own uh, Bibles from home, your own Chumash or Tanakh. Does somebody, anybody have a different translation um, for, and I don't know if it'll show up on the recording or not when it's, when it's, posted, for, uh, uh, when it's posted on YouTube. Uh, does anybody have a different translation for a um, expanse. Well, I have a yeah, sure. Why not? Let's have a look. Okay. 
a space. So I've got expanse, Scott has a space. This is all a translation of the Hebrew word rakia. Oh, um, I don't have the verse numbers in front of me. I think it's verse four, six. And I have no idea what, go ahead. And you've got expanse as well. So what is rakia? Uh, we've got expanse. We've got, um, nobody's got a really, ah, Sarah's got a different one. You have a different word. Go ahead, Sarah. The firmament. This is, this is like a more classical, traditional translation. And, and uh, although usually I would say, you know, what are you translating firmament? What are we in 1860? Uh, but in this case, for these purposes, firmament is actually a very good translation of rakia for our purposes this evening. So God said, let there be a firmament in the, the midst of the water to separate water from water. So we've got this thing, this rakia, this firmament. What is a firmament? I don't know. Let's keep reading, see if we can find out. <clears throat> it's something that's outside of our cultural repertoire. It's something, it's a word that made immediate sense and was immediately clear to the ancient Near Eastern peoples, including the early Israelites, who first read this passage. But to us, it makes very little sense. It's confusing. What is this space that separates water from water? God made the rakia, and it separated the water which was below the rakia from the water which was above the rakia, the space or expanse or firmament. And it was so God called the expanse sky, and there was the shemaim. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. Pay attention to the Hebrew words because they're going to be important. Even though I don't have them up here, the ones that I'm translating are, are probably going to be important later. I'll try to do as much as I can in English. Okay, we'll continue. There are a couple of other important Hebrew words that I skipped over, but we'll come back to. God said, let the water below the sky be gathered into one area and dry land can appear. And it was so God called the dry land earth, gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth sprout that vegetation, seed bearing plants, fruits and trees of every kind and bear that bear the fruit with the seed in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was so the earth brought forth vegetation, seed bearing plants of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God, said, and God saw that this was good, and there was evening and there was morning a third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse, again, the rakia, of the sky, to separate day from night. They shall serve as signs for the set times. Why do we have stars? It says right here, they're signs for the set times. And the days and the years to serve as lights in the expanse, uh, of the sky to shine upon the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights. This should sound familiar to anybody who's been outside and looked up at the sky in their lifetime. Two great lights. This is familiar. You, 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 Raul, you, you look puzzled by that. Have you ever been outside and look up? You see two great lights? <laughs> yeah. But there's two big ones. <laughs> <laughs> There's two main ones, the lesser to dominate the night and, uh, oh, I skipped ahead, the, the greater to dominate the day and the lesser to dominate the night, 
and the stars. So that's the sun and the moon, of course. God set them in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the earth, to dominate the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. God saw that this was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and birds that fly above the earth and below. And uh, God makes uh, be fertile of increase. I'm skipping ahead. There's birds in there. Uh, evening and morning, a fifth day. Let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, cattle, creeping things, and wild beasts of every kind. And it was so. God made wild beasts of every kind and cattle of every kind and all kinds of creeping things of the earth. And God saw that it was good, and God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, they shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Uh, and the, the chapter actually continues a little bit uh, with, the, with the rest of the sixth day and the seventh day. Be fertile and increase. That's in there too. But this is just a refresher. Hopefully this is not the first time you're seeing If this is the first time you're seeing this, I'm in trouble. I have not done my job up to this point. <laughs> or whatever rabbi or uh, whatever faith leader, parent uh, you, you grew up with and were raised with, uh, you know, was, was slacking. If this is the first time you're seeing this. This is just a review. Let's take a look at another text. This is the lost creation story. It is literally a creation story. It was literally lost. It's called Enuma Elish. How many of you have ever heard of the Babylonian myth Enuma Elish? A couple, but not too many. So we have, let me explain this picture that's here. Uh, if, if you Google Enuma Elish, you'll get this picture about 40 times in a row. Uh, I don't know, it's just a very popular image. <laughs> And it's a depiction that is relevant to what we're talking about here. We've got two figures um, that uh, this is probably um, uh, Ankidu and Tiamat, or possibly Marduk and Tiamat. Uh, actually, I, th I think, let me scratch that. I'm pretty sure that this is Marduk and Tiamat, who were two rival gods of ancient Babylonia ancient Babylonian mythology. And they're described in this text, which is known as Eluma, Enuma Elish. Getting myself tongue-tied. Enuma Elish. You may have heard of it. It is a Babylonian creation myth. This is in case you hadn't. This is a little bit of background. It includes a lot of other things as well. There's a flood narrative in here. Uh, there's, there's a lot of very interesting things and very interesting parallels with what we're familiar with. There's a story of, of people who try to build a tower up to the gods, and the god smacks it down. Okay, maybe it's ringing some bells. This is probably first composed. Uh, the, the earliest portions of this were probably first composed. 18th to 16th century BCE. This is like around the time of uh, like Abraham. This is very, very early on, maybe even a little bit before Abraham. Uh, if you've got your, your, you know, the biblical timeline in your mind. So you've got, you know, the, the, the BCE, CE changeover, right? That's uh, you, you don't just have to wind your watch back. You got to throw it out, get a new watch. It's a big changeover. All right, so before the BCE, that's before Common Era, or Common Era, which is what we're in right now, uh, before that changeover, you go back about a thousand years, and you're in the time of David and Solomon. You go back another thousand years, which is where we're talking about here, 1800s. Uh, you know, 18th century to 16th century BCE. This is this is now way before David. This is the the time of Abraham and and the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Sarah, uh, 
Yeah, this is the the, the patriarchs. <clears throat> I think they call it mid middle bronze too. I don't know all that stuff. <laughs> we need an archaeologist here who can tell me the the, the correct name for these different time periods. Uh, the copy that we have of Enuma Elish, uh, and there are multiple copies that have since been discovered, but the, the, the first one that was discovered or the oldest one that was discovered uh, is, is from, it's a copy from the 17th century BCE. So this is already a thousand years old, give or take, at the point that, that it's discovered. And it's still it's almost 3,000 years old to us. So this is a very, very old story. And it was a story that was familiar for a very long time. By the way, I find this so fascinating, being, being a, a student of, of uh, 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 you know, biblical academic study, uh, that you, you would never see something like this in description of um, a biblical text. You never see scholars say, oh, well, the copy that we have is from the 7th century, but we think it's probably a thousand years older than that. Uh, there, it's, it's always the interest in, um, no, the Bible was, was, you know, the copy we have is 2,000 years old, so probably it's, you know, 2,001 years old. Uh, it never, it's never cast back. Um, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, um, I, I think that there's some some underlying psychology there of, of you know the Bible is is uh, sort of adopted by Western civilization so we have this mentality it can't be that old but these sort of uh, um, you know sister texts that that existed in surrounding cultures uh, that share a lot of the stuff uh, you know people say oh well those are those are really ancient. Just an interesting aside. That's a comment on biblical scholarship, which, like everything else, I take with a grain of salt. Uh, I, I love it and I find it fascinating, but there are a lot of things that I love and find fascinating. Most things I find it's best to take with a grain of salt. If you, if you, take, it, if you take biblical archaeology as gospel, that to me is just as silly as taking you know, Midrash as literal gospel. Uh, which even Maimonides said you're not supposed to do. So this copy that we have comes from the library of uh, Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. Some of you might know this, the city of Nineveh from the Bible. You guys know where Nineveh is, where it shows up in, in the Tanakh, in the Bible? That's the city that Jonah was supposed to go to. I guess he did in the end. He, eventually, he got there, <laughs> took a roundabout path. <laughs> I mean, talk about a roundabout path. You ever have, you know, they, they say you should never uh, um, discuss your commute. Uh, there, there are three things. I, I forget that it's like your dream, you know, not your aspirations, but your literal dreams when you're sleeping. Your dreams, your commute, uh, and, and your meal. I, I, I forget the third one. Because while they're very interesting to you, nobody else cares. I heard that somewhere. I think if your commute is like, you know, Jonah, the whole book is a commute and it's a story that everybody knows. That's that's the worst commute of all time. Uh, Jonah's trip to Nineveh. So if if that's your commute, please do tell me. I am interested. <laughs> uh, that's the the um, where this was found. It was a major city in the ancient world. Uh, it was it was a major center of civilization. Everybody knew Nineveh. It was like the, the New York, New York of its era. This particular inscription was rediscovered or recovered by an English archaeologist, uh, Austin Henry Layard, in 1849. So this is, you know, a little over 150 years ago. Bef before that, we had we had no record of this. We had no idea what ancient Babylonian myths may have been. But now we do. Let's take a look at Enuma Elish. You've, those of you who have heard of it before, I bet you've never actually sat down and read it. Whenever we talk about Enuma Elish, 
you know, uh, academic scholars, they always describe it to you, but they, they never actually put it in front of you. This is an edited version because it's kind of long. Uh, it's not that long. You can go online and you can read the full thing, uh, at least this particular passage that deals with creation. The, the full document, the full text is, is lengthy. But the portion that deals with creation is, uh, you know, three or four pages. You can, you can sit down and do it in one, in one sitting. <clears throat> so this is, this is pretty significantly abridged, but I try to hit the high points. Here's how it begins. When in the heights, heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name. As this, they say, they, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. This, this, you should hear a little bit of rhyming language with that very familiar text that we just read from Genesis. And the primeval Apsu, who begat them, and Chaos Tiamat, mother of them both. Did anybody have, I forgot to ask, I'm going to go back here to the very beginning of Genesis. When God began to create the heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void. Does anybody have a translation there different than unformed and void? This is tohu vavohu. It is a fascinating phrase. We don't, we don't know exactly what it means because these words don't show up in that way anywhere else. Scott. Shapeless and formless. Shapeless and formless. Anybody else have something different than shapeless and formless? Chaos and chaos and unformed. And over the chaotic waters. Astonishingly empty. Tohu vavohu. Astonishingly empty. Chaos and unformed. Now we're starting to get this. See, this is why you need to look at multiple translations. One translation will give you, it's, it's like a snapshot, the difference between a snapshot and a film. You know, you want the flipbook version to get the full story. A snapshot is not going to do it if you're really trying to get to the, the essence of, of the words. <clears throat> so now we're starting to get a sense of tohu va vohu. It's not just unformed and void. There's, there's a little bit more, there's a little spice on there, right? <clears throat> Coming back to Anuma Elish. When in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did it not yet bear a name, the primeval Apsu who begat them, and Chaos, Tiamut, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together. Waters were mingled together. And no field was formed, no marsh was yet to be seen. Then were created the gods in the midst of heaven, thus were, thus, were, thus were created, and so were the great gods. But Tiamat and Apsu were still in confusion. They were troubled and in disorder. Troubled and disorder. Tohu vavohu. And Tiamat hearkened unto the word of the bright god and said, Let us wage war. And they joined their forces and made war. Umu Hubar, which is another name for Tiamat, who formed all things, made, in addition, weapons invincible. She spawned monster serpents, sharp of tooth and merciless of fang, with poison instead of blood. You remember that picture we looked at where she's like this scary dragon monster? That's a depiction of Tiamat the mother goddess of, of ancient Babylonia. With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. Fierce monster vipers she clothed with terror. With splendor she decked them. She made them lofty of stature. Giant, poisonous, uh, 
monsters. I don't know how else you call it. But Marduk hath set out the director of the gods. I, I, I don't know uh, uh, ancient Akkadian, so I don't know if director is, I don't know what, what that is as a translation. The chief among the gods, perhaps? Something like that. When I read this, the word director as the translation just stood out. It seems out of place there to me. Uh, so Marduk is the director of the gods. He's the, 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 the head god, the, the CEO god. <laughs> However you want to translate. I, I don't even know the word that it's translating because I don't know ancient Akkadian. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to phone a friend on that one. To set out against Tiamat. His heart hath prompted him. He made ready his bow. He chose his weapon and slung a spear upon him as he fastened it. He raised the club. This is skipping forward again a little bit. Raised the club in his right hand. He gripped it. The bow and the quiver he hung at his side. He set the lightning in front of him. With burning flame he filled his body. He made a net to enclose the inward parts of Tiamat. The four winds he stationed so that nothing of her might escape. The south, the north, the east, the west wind. So he's attacking Tiamat. He's got a spear and a net. He surrounded Tiamat with the four winds. <clears throat> then the Lord, meaning Marduk, raised the thunderbolt, his mighty weapon, mounted on chariots, storm of unequaled terror. He perceived the muttering of Kingu, her spouse. And Marduk gazed, gazed. Kingu was troubled in his gait. His will was destroyed and his motion ceased. The Lord spread out his net and caught her. And the evil wind that was behind him let loose in her face. As Tiamat opened her mouth to its full extent, he drove in the evil wind while as yet she had not shut her lips. The terrible winds filled her belly and her courage was taken from her. Her mouth she opened wide. He seized the spear and burst her belly. Then the Lord rested. Gazing upon her dead body. Well, I told you this was TV 14. Gazing upon her dead body while dividing the flesh. Uh, and, and he devised a cunning plan. He split her up like a flat fish into two halves. Uh, I've, I've seen this translated as like a, like a shellfish into two halves, a clamshell splitting up or a mussel into two halves. So you've got these, you know, Tiamat, he's filled her up like a balloon with these evil winds and chopped her in half. So half is up here and half is down here. <clears throat> One half of her he established as a covering for heaven. He fixed a bolt, he stationed a watchman, he bade them not to let her waters come forth. And he passed through the heavens, surveyed the regions thereof, and against the deep, he set the dwelling of Nidimud. He, Marduk, made the stations for the great gods, the stars, their images, and the stars of the zodiac he fixed. He ordained the year into sections he divided it. What are the stars doing here? Marking the days, marking the time. The moon god, he caused to shine forth the night he entrusted to him. He appointed him a being of the night to determine the days. He opened his mouth and unto Ea he spoke. That which he had conceived in his heart, he imparted into him, My blood I will take, and my bone I will fashion to make man, that I may create man who shall inhabit the earth, that the service of the gods may be established, and that their shrines may be built. That's it for now. Here's a... Art, another artistic depiction of Tiamat. You can imagine this, this serpent monster uh, stretched out and pulled open 
and cut. I, I also like that image, you know, like a, like a fish. You ever fillet a fish and you've got, you know, you cut it like this and you flip, do the little flip movement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Latins know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Linda can do that. I, I, I have no idea how. I just I just know how to eat it. <laughs> um, or you can imagine a shellfish, um, you know, an oyster cracked open, and you've got the the top and the bottom. <clears throat> Here's an Egyptian depiction of the world with the sky goddess stretched over the dome of the sky, with all of the people inside. Can you see this? Is it too small? You can make it out. Here is a uh, um, early Christian depiction. Well, it's not actually an early Christian. This is this particular drawing, if I recall, is about seventeen uh, hundreds. So I can't say early Christian for sure. Um, <clears throat> But it's a depiction of what the early uh, Christian understanding of the, the world may have been. And I wonder if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. I might, I might have a way to do that. Let me, let me take a look here. I don't know if I actually can, but let's see. Here, that should help a little bit. Actually, that's exactly the same size, isn't it? You just can't see me anymore. It's just centered. <clears throat> In any case, um, I might have to send you the link. Uh, I'll tell you what it says. <laughs> I'll sort of, because I know it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty small. Uh, but up here at the top, I, I even have to lean in close to read it myself. Uh, you've, you've got some very interesting things here. You've got what the rakia over the top here, over the top here, right? Stars, moon, you've got the, the openings in the dome of the sky. Here, actually, let me, let me replace this. Underneath, you've got to home the great deep. Let me replace this with, with a, a modern, more modern rendition uh, that's going to be a little bit easier to see. Um, I knew that was there. Why didn't I use it in the first place? I don't know. <laughs> you've got, you've got uh, the waters above the firmament forming this dome, and the waters below the firmament, those are, you know, that's the oceans. You've got the earth and the pillars of the earth. You can't see the sides of this image, but uh, Imagine at the sides of this dome where the dome meets the water, you also have the pillars of the sky. So this, this continues down and you've got a pillar here and on the other side, pillars there. You know, what did uh, Marduk do? You know, once, once he had this, this ballooned up sky shape for Tiamat, her body which formed the waters, and she, you know, Tiamat is the, the goddess of waters, uh, water and storm and things like that. Uh, set boundaries, said, okay, we're going to set one wind at each corner to guard her and keep her from escaping or achieving her, her previous form or her next form, whatever that might be. And then put the sun and the moon and the stars inside there. <clears throat> This conception of the world is not so unfamiliar to ancient, uh, in the ancient Near East. This was widespread. This conception of the, the sky being a dome with waters above the dome, this was the accepted cosmology, the accepted universe of the ancient Near East. Uh, by the way, if you if if any of this is if you're not terrified with these these descriptions of Tiamat and and her her brutal you know evisceration by the god Marduk and forming the sky, 
Uh, if that's not terrifying to you, this should be terrifying. The reason that uh, I have a modern rendition of this is because that's also uh, the same theory that flat earthers follow, which are people that walk around today that believe that this is what the world uh, looks like or some version of this. Uh, so they make these modern renditions and say, see, this is what they thought in the Bible, but now we know it's only slightly different. Uh, and the sky is <clears throat> this firmament, this firm thing. There's, there's not another word for firmament. That's why it's a good translation. It's a unique thing in the world, but we know it's firm, right? It's solid, some kind of a solid thing that forms this dome and it holds back the water of the sky. The implication being, if you've got the winds at the four corners holding down the sky so the sky doesn't, you know, swallow up the earth, and you've got the firmament, uh, or in our case, a net, right, of Marduk, or not our case, <laughs> the one we just read, this net to hold back the sky, the implication being, if those precautions were to ever fail, then there would be, you know, if, if this, if the sky broke open, uh, it wouldn't be just, I always want to say Chicken Little. That's, is Chicken Little the one with the, the sky is falling? Okay, yes. I get, there, there are too many chicken stories. We need, we've got a whole, like, whole barnyard to choose from. Why are, why is it always a chicken? Um, Chicken Little. <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the road? Uh, uh, Hen Henny Penny. Is Henny Penny the sky is falling? I don't know. One, whichever one. So Henny Penny is not the sky is falling. Henny Penny is different. I'm getting, I'm getting somebody shaking their head. All right. That'll be another class for another time. <laughs> We've got this uh, these precautions in place to keep the sky from flooding the earth, to keep the sky from swallowing up the earth. And these, these pillars that are established to keep the waters of the deep from rising up. Uh, and we have these, this, um, you know, this, this, um, we're living in this world that, you know, the, the water can come through sort of as a trickle and that's fine. Uh, later on in, in uh, Enuma Elish, we read that those are Tiamat's tears crying for her missing children. Um, or, no, actually, I'm getting that mixed up. That's uh, um, Greek. The Greeks also have a similar, um, have a, a, a similar cosmology, the ancient Greeks. We're talking way before Zeus. These are the, 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 the gods like several generations before Zeus came along. Um, <clears throat> the ancient Greek cosmology was very similar, where you had the, the waters uh, you know, formed out of the body of a god that was, was separated, or two gods that were separated in that case. <clears throat> so how are these two narratives similar? We've got a similar opening, the formless, uh, formlessness and use of the image of the world being found in the deep waters. By the way, what is the word for deep in Hebrew? Anybody have the Hebrew text in front of them? Raul or Paulette or Sarah? It's a race. <laughs> So in that same verse, I think it was verse four, we've got the, the face. Now let's go back. Let's look at Genesis. Um, <clears throat> Amok is, is depth. Um, in, in this passage, there's a particular word that's used for uh, the, the, the deep. Uh, what's that? To home, exactly. So pa Paulette, you get a gold star. Scott, you only get a silver star. 
<laughs> you got the right word, but the wrong verse. <laughs> it, uh, there's there's a separate part where we talk about uh, amok, the the depth. Um, <clears throat> but here we have the deep is to home. Is there anybody in this story <clears throat> of Enuma Elish? whose name sounds similar to the word to home. Tiamat, to home, to home at, Tiamat. It sounds even closer if you're, if you're naturally a Semitic language speaker. Tiamat and to home are the same word. So how did Tiamat get up in our Bible? How did she end up there? Because this was already the conception of the world that existed. This is what uh, this this is what the the uh, understanding of the world was before the Torah arrived. This is what the Torah arrived into. In the Babylonian myth, uh, when above the heaven had not yet been named and below the earth had not yet been called by its name, etc. In Genesis, in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. We've got this uh, description of God creating a firmament that corresponds with the net that Marduk creates. In the Babylonian myth, we've got this upper and lower half of Tiamat to open her up like a muscle into two parts. That's from a different translation. Half of her he set in place to form the sky as a roof. He fixed the crossbar and posted the guards. He commanded them not to let her waters escape. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters, the waters above and the waters below. <clears throat> a similar construction of heavens and the creation of days and seasons. Uh, in Babylonian, uh, he fixed Asherah, the great abode, his likeness with which he made the ferment. Uh, this is part, part that was sort of uh, edited out, but we have, he constructed the stations for their gods, fixing their astral likenesses as constellations. Again, a different translation, but putting the constellations in the sky to define the days of the year. In Genesis, let the lights of the firmament of the heavens separate the days and nights, and let them, be for, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So why do we have stars? They mark the time. <clears throat> and this, this is, uh, just as an interesting aside, when we talk about that other creation story, we have this, you know, creation of uh, human beings, right? You saw that flesh and bone, uh, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. That's a phrase that you probably know from the Torah, from the Bible. In Enuma Elish, uh, man is created from blood. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, man is made from the clay of the earth. And we have sort of this mixture between these two. Both of these show up in our story, in the creation of, uh, in, the, in the first creation story, we are, uh, sorry, in the creation of Adam, we have the formation out of clay, and in the formation of Eve, we have out of blood and bone, right? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. We have, oops, that's the end. <laughs> Let me pull that back up here so that we can look one last time at the... Oops, I lost you. All right. So we can look one last time at the uh, narrative that we see in Genesis. 
with this image in mind, with this image of a clamshell uh, universe, with some sort of a barrier keeping the waters of the sky at bay, and how does it rain? Well, the, the, that barrier opens. There are gates. There are doors. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We still have that imagery in our High Holiday Liturgy. We have the gates of heaven opening and closing for prayers. But they, they're transformed. They serve a different function. The imagery of High Holidays is completely different from the imagery that we see here. So let's take another look. Now that we know the background of where this story came from. Imagine all you knew about the world was this myth of Tiamat and you know the, the waters above, the waters below formed out of this, this war between the gods and the, the, the you know body. What do you, what do you, there's a medical term for cutting this bisected body of Tiamat that were trapped inside of. Doesn't it make you feel a little bit claustrophobic, this imagining that this is your world? <clears throat> now imagine you've never, you're just standing at Sinai, you're about to hear this. You can imagine it however you would like. You're seeing this for the first time. When God began to create the heaven and the earth, the earth being unformed and void, so far we're familiar, right? So, okay, earth starts out unformed and void. I know that. Everybody knows that. With darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. How is the wind different here? Before, we've got this evil wind, right? And it's attacking. It's a, like weaponized wind. Here, you've got this pleasing, pleasant, peaceful wind of God sweeping over the water. It's not doing anything to the water, it's just sweeping over the water. Or hovering above the water is another translation. <clears throat> God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. What does Marduk separate? One half of Tiamat from the other half. What does God separate? The light from the darkness. Those feel different, right? Completely different sense of what's happening here. <clears throat> God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water, that it may separate water from water. And God made the expanse and separated the water which was below the expanse and the water which was above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and morning a second day. Now that you have this chaotic, violent, uh, frightening story in your mind, when you come back and read what's in the Torah, it feels totally different from any other time you've read it before. Am I right? Now you get a sense of the message. The purpose of this telling of the story, the very surface meaning, is to present a god. First of all, are there a bunch of different gods fighting? No, there's just one god. And what is this god doing? Is he karate chopping the world in half and doing... No, just making a separation here, putting this over. It's orderly. It's calm. It's peaceful. Isn't this the world that you would much rather live in? That's the theology that's happening here. This is what our God, ours is a God of not chaos, but of order, not of war, but of, uh, you know, peacefully arranging the universe. The cosmology is the same. And you could argue <clears throat> that perhaps the early Israelites were not prepared if God explained the Big Bang and evolution and all of these things. It wouldn't have made any sense to the ancient Israelites. Uh, there's 
I'm forgetting his name, but there's a there's a, a very prominent contemporary Orthodox rabbi who who uh, writes about this argument very clearly. Um, that's you know in this world that that uh, uh, the the Torah entered into. It was written, uh, and this goes even back to uh, uh, Maimonides, who said the Torah is written in words of human beings. It's written in human words. Actually, even before that, in the Talmud, you have this discussion: is the word is 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 the Torah written in the word of human beings? Meaning, is it written in words that we are meant to understand? And the answer is yes. God's talking to human beings, and God knows that God is talking to human beings. That's the classical Jewish answer to why is the Torah written the way it is. Or you could say, speaking as a, as a uh, biblical scholar, take a more academic, a more clinical view of what we're looking at here and say, you know, this is a text that was presented to people to form a theology, to present an idea about what the universe looks like and what this new God represents. This God, Adonai, Elohim, well, in this case, Elohim. Who is this Elohim that we want to introduce to people? What do you put on the front of the pamphlet? All right, first of all, there are no other gods wandering around. You just have one God to worry about. That's, that's already sort of relaxing. I'm like, oh, I don't have to worry about some other God coming and killing my God? Great, I love that. I don't have to worry about my God getting, you know, angry and, and starting a big storm? Even better. Although that kind of happens a little bit later. It's dealt with in an interestingly similar way. What does God do? God creates peaceful, reasonable, orderly separations. Ours is a God of order and a God of peace. That's ultimately what you see here. <clears throat> and that's my final thought for this session. I'm going to stop the recording, assuming I can figure out how. Stop.